God bless you, man. Hallelujah. Somebody celebrate Professor Edith Wilson for me. I love her, I love her, I love her with passion. And just like our daddy, was it yesterday daddy was introducing her? Or day before yesterday? You know, and daddy was calling, was saying that she's the um, immediate past vice chancellor <laughs> of UNN. We were trying to correct daddy. And then second, on a second thought, we told daddy, that's prophetic, that's prophetic. <laughs> Maybe the Lord is seeing it and it's going to come to pass. Hallelujah. Father, we are more than grateful to you for this morning. Our hearts are full of joy. Just thanking you for what you've been doing in this meeting. Oh God, it is marvelous in our eyes. Testimonies upon testimonies upon testimonies are already coming out of this meeting. We give you all the glory in the name of Jesus Christ. Father God, in this Lord, we ask that that which you have in mind to download upon our homes, upon our marriages, will be released freely from the throne room in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Heavenly Father. It's your desire that we'll have exciting marriages. It's your desire that we will enjoy our marriages. Spirit of the living God, we have just been told that it's not of him that will it or run it. It's of the Lord that shows mercy. Lord, without you, there is nothing we are able to achieve. If it had not been you that had been on our side, we would not be able to do anything. Therefore, take over. Take over. Whatever needs to be done in our different homes, the surgeries that need to be done in our hearts, in our homes, go ahead and do that today. Let your name alone be lifted and glorified. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Um, just before I get into the message, I, I want to um, say that I'm speaking from the book, Killing the Marriage Killers. And um, I'll just share the much I can. You can get the book for yourself. Yesterday, uh, somebody was here who was introducing some products to us and talked about the need to detoxify ourselves. A lot of people cashed into that opportunity yesterday. I've also done mine. And I want to encourage those who haven't. It makes a lot of difference to get your system cleaned up. When we talk about detoxification, we're talking about removing toxins from your system. It's like betting inside. Betting yourself from the inside. Because as we move around, the things we inhale, the things we eat, we gather and accumulate toxins into our system. So when you detoxify yourself, you know, you remove those toxins and then you improve your blood circulation and then, you know, it just cleanses your system, cleans you from the inside. And it's such a privilege that we have an opportunity to do that in this conference. And then the product they advertise, I personally have used it from March and the Lord God that you move by will say, Jehovah has 250 million ways of answering one prayer. God passed through those products to do a great restoration in our health. And since March, our health has never been the same. It's just natural. There is no chemical inside of it. And then, because when God wants to restore, he restores wholesomely. You know, so he said, I'm not just going to restore your health. I will also put wealth in your hand. And I tell you, since March till today, so much, you know, wealth has entered my pocket to the glory of God. And then at a point, the Lord said, bless my ministers, bless my sons and daughters. Some of them don't even bother taking care of their health from the blessings I've given to you. Put in one million. And just use it as product and bless different ministers. He was giving me the names of the ministers. I was writing them down. 
And each of them got three of those products. Three like that. I sent it around. What? One million. And he said, I will pay you back. I just want you to bless them. Don't make them conscious of the fact that I'm interested in their health. And I want them to be interested in their health. Do you know, one week after I did it, the Lord gave me back double of that money. So I got back my, my capital, you know, and then I got back a million naira gain on top of it. So God is interested in our taking care of our health. And this one is not something that has any side effect on anybody's body. So I am bold to introduce it because testimonies are everywhere of what the Lord has done. So my joy is not even the money that it has given me. My joy is people calling back to say, hey, mommy, thank you. Mommy, thank you. This one was happening to me. Now I don't see it again. You know, I've gone to hospital. I've gone here. I've gone here. And look at this one. God passed through it and he has settled my health. So I want to encourage those who can, please do something and take care of this temple. It needs to be taken care of so we can fulfill ministry and make impact. The, uh, the topic I have before me this morning is secrets to achieving an exciting marriage. Secrets to achieving an exciting marriage. And then I just want to Read from Ephesians chapter 5, from verse 22 to 29. If you can put it up for me, media, please. Ephesians chapter 5. Okay, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body to their own husbands in everything husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife, loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes, cherishes it even as the Lord the church. All right, we're going to be looking at that scripture as we go ahead. But I want to say a little bit about what marriage is and what the word exciting means, and then we will take it from there. Marriage, like you already know, is the mutual coming together of two different people, male and female. Male and female in holy matrimony to share their lives together. And the essence of marriage is to help the two individuals to maximize the achievement of divinely assigned life goals. Like you have always heard me say, there is no non-entity, you know, in God's vineyard. Every one of us is loaded with seeds of greatness on the inside of us. When God brings a man and a woman together in holy matrimony, he wants to tap from what he has put in this one and tap from what he has put in this other one. Together, both of them can maximize the achievement of their divinely assigned goals. So, every one of us have an assignment from God. Just like every marriage has an assignment from God. Marriage is a ministry, says one man of God. And couples are on assignment. So you need to find out, Lord, what is the assignment you've given to me and my husband? 
what is the assignment? Because the way God looks at a successful marriage is not a marriage where you have plenty houses and you have plenty cars and you know every morning you get up, you hug each other and you say, I love you, I love you darling. I love you, I love you honey. No, a successful marriage in God's agenda is a marriage that is making impact, carrying out the assignment that God has given to the couple. We've just been taught about impact. If you are making impact, your, your, your presence must be felt. There must be a change in the environment where you are. You must touch lives and bring about something new in the lives of men and women. So God gave Adam and Eve. He created them, brought them together and gave them their mandate. Gave them an assignment for their generation. So, God is excited about the home because that is the first institution he created. And he's the one that builds the house. If he doesn't build, those who are building, they are laboring in vain. Whatever happens in the home affects the church, affects the society, affects the nations. It's like a remote control device that controls whatever happens in the wider space. But the devil knows how important this marital relationship is to God. It's a mystery. Relationship between husband and wife is a mystery because that's the only relationship that could be compared with our relationship with Jesus. The relationship between Jesus and the church is a mystery. But it's so dear to the heart of God. And the devil knows how dear this mysterious relationship is to the heart of God. And he's working so hard. Working so hard to make sure that he tarnishes this wonderful relationship. You have often heard me share the story. It's also in the book, Killing the Marriage Killers. For those who have never heard me share the story about Satanists who went on a hundred days global fast. They had a global fast for hundred days. And what was the agenda? They had two major prayer points. At least that the brother who shared the story was able to get the two major prayer points. They may have had many more prayer points. Their first prayer point was to destabilize all those marriages you call Christian marriages. They were not happy to see them survive. They wanted them to crumble. So you see husband and wife who are getting on so well. Suddenly, they start having issues in their marriage. And they don't even understand where their problem is coming from. The devil is behind it. If they don't know that the devil is the architect of their problem, they begin to fight each other. You have heard of people who have been married for years, 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, and suddenly they divorce. And they give you one excuse or the other. Either their wife is a witch or one problem or the other. But they don't know that the enemy is the one causing the problem in their life. The Satan is said, their number two prayer point is to scatter those ministries, big, big ministries, will be big men of God. They want to cause confusion in their midst. They want to even make their children useless and vagabonds so that their children will be a reproach to the gospel they preach. And we already see such things happening around us. So the enemy is not happy when he sees good marriages that are surviving. And so he decided to take his headquarters to the home. Christian homes in particular. To release siege against Christian marriages. But we declare from this altar that his assignment has come to an end. In the name of Jesus Christ. Yesterday the Lord said to us, I will make a determined end in the midst of the land. And we read another scripture that says, surely there is an end. So even if you are here and you are one of those that is going through a troublesome marriage, a storm-filled marriage, today the Lord is making a determined end to that harassment in the name of Jesus. Today 
that storm from hell is coming to an end. In the name of Jesus Christ. The Lord said one of the things he's going to do in this conference, he's not just going to heal people, you know, of physical ailment. He's going to heal hearts. Because he said there's so many hearts that came here wounded. So many hearts that are here that are bleeding. I know a lot of healing took place yesterday. Whatever is left, the Lord will deal with it today. In the name of Jesus Christ. He said you're going home with tangible miracles. Tangible miracles. Tangible miracles. In the name of Jesus Christ. You know, we are not just talking for talking's sake. I want you to be expectant. Because Jehovah overdue and superdue is in the camp. Yesterday, while we were praying about the wars, you know, coming to an end, the woman and her wars, and then we were bringing all those wars to an end. Me too. I was there praying and crying out to the Lord. I said, God, settle my children. Settle my children. That is the greatest desire in my heart right now. Settle them. They're about to enter university and we're still wondering which way do they go? Where are they going? Meanwhile, the Lord has spoken to us long ago. He said, I'm going to give them scholarship. But we didn't know where the scholarship was going to come from. Do you know yesterday, yesterday, after that prayer, hey, I got good news. A university that is both a Nigerian university and an international university has given scholarship, 100% scholarship to two of my children. Hallelujah! I danced and danced and danced yesterday and I was so filled with joy that when I wanted to sleep last night, I could not sleep. The joy made me, I could not sleep. I said, God, just like that, is that how you answer prayer? They will school two days here in Nigeria and the school will take them abroad to finish up abroad and come back. And everything I have desired is part of what is in the school. I do not know how to thank God enough. You are next in line for a miracle. You are next in line for a miracle. Before you leave this camp, you will get a phone call. You will hear good news that we gladden your heart in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So when we say something is exciting, we're actually talking about something that causes great enthusiasm. Something that makes you very happy. And it is the will of God that our marriages will be happy. He doesn't desire that we will endure marriages that a lot of believers are enduring their marriages. It is God's desire that our marriages will be exciting. That he will settle us in our homes. And I'm going to quickly run through some of the things that the Lord desires us to do as our own contribution, as our own part that we need to play to begin to enjoy an exciting marriage. Hallelujah. Number one, the Lord expects you and your husband to live together, not as cat and dogs, but to live as friends. He wants you to be the best of friends. You want to have an exciting marriage. You must know that it's not a master-servant relationship. It's a love relationship. You've got to live together. You've got to be friends with each other. Because marriage is 90% friendship. It's only 10% of fulfilling obligations. Because God wants us to be companions. He said in Genesis 2.18, it is not good for this man to be alone. So the major reason why God, you know, created the institution called marriage is for companionship. He wants the man to, to partner with the woman as friends. It's a teamwork so they'll be able to accomplish destiny. So loneliness is a marriage killer. There are many people that are, you know, married, but they are, they, they are lonely. They are not alone, but they are lonely. They are not friends. They are like two, 
you know, tenants sharing the same flat who don't talk to each other, who don't float together. That is not the will of God. If God wanted a woman to be a man's slave, you, you often hear me say this, he would have taken us from under their feet because there were bones there. But he didn't take us from under their feet. If he wanted two captains that would be struggling for one birth, he could have taken us from their head. There are bones in the head. But God consciously chose to take us from the side, from the river. This is the side, you know, for companionship, for friendship. This is how you hold somebody who is dear to you. You hold him as a friend. Minus that, he took us from the rib. And one of the meanings of the rib, the word rib in Greek, the meaning, one of his meanings is something that provides balance and stability. Something, you know, that gives you balance and stability. Something that gives you support. So God took us from there to give our husbands support. To provide balance. To provide stability to them. And then of course the rib covers the heart. Covers the lungs. These are two very important organs. That when they pack up, the man is gone. And God said, I'm taking you from here so you can encompass your husband. The Bible says in Jeremiah, the Lord is doing a new thing upon the earth. A woman shall encompass a man. A woman shall make a champion out of a man. The man's dreams are stored in his heart. So you are taken from there to shield his dreams. So when the enemy wants to harass your husband, he sees you in the rib. And you tell him, this is my garden. The Lord has given me to tend. What are you looking for here? This is not your project. It is Project Jehovah. Hand it over to me. To show that. So you are supposed to be your husband's best friend. You are supposed to be his fan, his encourager, his cheerleader. When both of you are together, it goes a long way. It provokes blessings from the Lord. The Bible says in Psalm 133, verse 1 to 3, Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It's like the precious oil on the, on the head, running down on the bed, on the bed of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hammon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commands his blessings and life forevermore. So live it together. In harmony and in unity. With your hearts. Joined together. It's indispensable. For an exciting marriage. It not only releases fresh oil. Upon your heads and on your marriage. But it also releases great anointing on the marriage. It opens the heavens. And provokes the blessings of the Lord. Over the marriage. So I tell every Christian wife. See yourself. As your husband's sanctified, consecrated girlfriend. Be his confidant. Be his special friend. You know, let him be able to put his trust, you know, to trust you enough to share his deepest thoughts, his hearts, his desires, his dreams with you. And when he's sharing with you, give him your rapt attention. Strive to have the mindset of a girlfriend. You know, don't just tell yourself, I mean, uh, he has married me, he has married me. You know, no shaking. No, be a friend and be a sweet one for that matter. Whatever you think your husband will ever solicit from a concubine, you know, you are the best, the sanctified, consecrated girlfriend. The only one approved by heaven to meet his needs, his emotional needs. You do it with passion. Do it like you understand that this is my assignment. My husband is my project. I need to take good care of him. Number two. Be a helper and a support to each other. You want to enjoy an exciting marriage. Be a helper and a support to your husband. Understand the position you occupy in his life. It's a very sensitive one. You occupy a sensitive position in his life and ministry. Proverbs 18.22 says, He that finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. You are there. 
as a wife. You are the good thing, the treasure that the Lord has given to him. You are supposed to be his encourager. You are supposed to be his fan, his cheerleader. You are supposed to boost his morale. Be the one to pump in strength into him. Even when both of you are going through, you know, any kind of storm. Don't be the discourager. Don't be the one releasing blames every day. Be the one to tell him, it is well. We are going through. We are going through this storm together. And we are going to come out stronger on the other side. The Bible says that Adam was given a helper. God said, I will make a helper. Not a viper. And I used to say, whilst some women are helpers, some others are vipers. Biting their husbands every day. He talks what you talk to. He can't even say anything. Because you always have the answer. He that findeth the wife, not a knife. Why some are wives, others are knives. And all they do is to cut their husbands here and there. And make life miserable for such husbands. I don't think such wives are here. Are they here? No, I don't think they came. <laughs> it is those people we invited that did not come. to this conference, I don't know what they are doing at home. But those of us who are here, we are here because on our head is a helping anointing. Hallelujah. Every one of us that is here, the Lord calls you an embodiment of solution. That's how you came on board in the first place. You came on board to solve a problem. The first problem Jehovah encountered in creation. He used you to solve it. And right from creation, an, an oil of solution has been resting on your head. And from this altar, I activate that oil. In the name of Jesus, let it speak in your home. Let it speak in your workplace. Let it speak in your family. In the name of Jesus Christ. Proverbs 31 verse 12. The Bible reminds us of the virtuous woman. She does her husband good and not evil. All all the days of her life. She wasn't a burden. No, no, no. She wasn't a problem. She was a solution. She does her husband good and not evil. Don't be an embarrassment to your husband. Be a value enhancer. Let it be that because you came into his life, his worth, his price tag has increased because of you. That's what it ought to be. You don't come to devalue you don't come to take away from his life and make him begin to see himself now as a shadow and begin to wish he was a lord. No, add up to him. Let it be clear, not just to him, but to the whole world that you're stepping into his life has become like one chasing a thousand and two chasing ten thousand. Bring him honor. Bring him honor. Bring him honor. Not this honor. And then it's so, so important that you sow, sow into your husband. And husband, sow into your wife. I know there are men that are here and some who are watching us online. Invest, invest, invest in your wife. Be a support to each other. Don't feel threatened. Marriage is not a place you come and be competing and comparing. You know, I don't want to, you know, invest much into my wife before she becomes swollen headed and wants to be bigger than me. That is nonsense. It doesn't make any sense. Because the two are already one. The two are one. If you win, you win together. If you lose, you lose together. So pour into your wife. Don't be afraid. The Bible said they that compare themselves with themselves are fools. So if you stay there and then you want to be comparing yourself with your wife, you are foolish. But when you invest into your wife meaningfully, she multiplies you. You know, there's something good about us women. We have a way of multiplying anything that is given to us. The woman is a wonder. She's a mystery. Many, many parts of her body are elastic. Do you know that? Certain stages of the life of a woman, certain seasons of her life, her breast begins to expand. And after that season, the breast comes back to normal size. Certain seasons of your life, stomach begins to enlarge and expand. 
After that season, stomach shrinks and comes back to size. <laughs> Certain seasons of the life of a woman, when she's in the labor room, that place that enters into the Holy of Holies, it begins to expand. They call it dilation. And before you know it, one big-headed boy or girl will come out from that tiny little space. It is mystery and it is the wonder of womanhood. Can you celebrate the woman? Celebrate yourself. You are not just ordinary. There's something about you. That is why a man will release to the woman. Tiny little speed, cosmen. Seed, cosmen. You can't even see it with ordinary eye. But because we have a nurturing and a multiplication anointing, we are able to nurture that seed on the inside of us. Because we are life givers. We came from Eve, the mother of the living. Her name means life giver. So we carry that anointing of releasing life. We not show the seed they give to us. And then we're able to give back to them. Bouncing baby boy. Bouncing baby girl. Sometimes we dash them two or three or four. That is the power of multiplication that the woman carries. Help me celebrate womanhood again. Hallelujah. So be your husband's better half. Consciously work on being a better half. Not a bitter half. Be the best. Be the best that you can be to add up to your husband. Number three, appreciate, respect, compliment, and admire your spouse. Appreciate, respect, compliment, and admire your spouse. Appreciation will achieve a better result from your spouse than destructive criticism will. Many spouses have lost their self-esteem because of verbal abuses that they receive from each other. Learn to appreciate your spouse profusely. If you want to really be appreciative, there are so many things to appreciate about your spouse. So many things, so many things. Be grateful, learn gratitude. Some men are so ungrateful that a woman does not go out there Maybe to go and make money. But she's in the house. She's taking care of the home. She goes to market, comes back and cook. She makes sure you eat. She takes care of the children. Does not mean that she's a foolish woman, that she's a lazy woman. It depends. Even though I encourage every woman to have some kind of means of bringing in resources. Because we look at the virtuous woman. She was not just a prayer warrior. She was not just a woman that cooked. The Bible says she was an international merchant. She got her goods from afar. International business woman. That kind of woman, I don't know whether the husband even bought a pin, brought in a pin into the house. Because she's the one that saw to the ways of her household. She made sure there was food in the house. She made sure everybody had, you know, good clothes to wear. She changed the bedsheet. She did this and did that. She was on her feet. But she was also a spiritual woman. The Bible says her lamp did not go out at night. So it wasn't just that she was busy taking care of physical things. She gave time also to her spiritual life. And she knew she needed to stand in the gap on behalf of her children and her husband. So she was also a praying woman. There is no reason why any of us here should be lazy. Laziness. No, 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 no. There's no room for that. You cannot afford to be an apostolic woman and be a complacent, lazy woman. No! It does not add up. We are people that are heading to the front line. And you don't stay on your ivory bed and then find yourself on the front line. No! It takes hard work to get there. The grace of God adds also on the little effort you are making. Grace does not mean laziness. Paul said, I labor more than all of you. Yet it wasn't about my labor. It was the grace of God. But that did not remove the fact that there is the place for labor. There's the place for hard work in serving the Lord. So appreciate the effort that your husband is making. Husbands appreciate your wife's effort to put, you know, spirit and soul together. Let there be respect. 
in the relationship. No matter how short your husband is and you are tall, at least you accepted to marry him. So you cannot also turn around and call him Maltese bottle. Because you knew he was a Maltese bottle. And you chose to marry him. So marrying him means you have already called yourself Mrs. Maltese bottle. Give him the respect due him. <laughs> Give him the respect that is due him. My people used to say in Igbo land, anyhow, a man hand shot. Eh? He doesn't call another man to come and to say to come and help him hold his wife. Did you understand that? <laughs> No matter how short a man's hand is, no man will be with the wife in bed and call another man and say, come, I beg my hand, not the feet go around my wife. Come and help me hold her. <laughs> he goes, take carry that short hand. Take and manage, hold a wife. Because that is a responsibility no other man can do for you. <laughs> so respect your husband. After all, now your choice. Eh? Maybe those who have, you know, big height came. And you turned them down. And when this one came, you know, your heart was doing you polina, 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 polina. He said, now this one, why I won't marry. So give him the respect and the honor that is due him. Honor him. You treat your husband like a king. And then he will treat you like a queen. Let it be that anybody who sees any of us anywhere, the way we honor our husbands, the way we respect them, the way we take good care of them, they will say, ah, that lady is an apostolic woman. That's what they do there. Ah, those people, they don't joke with their husbands. So you cannot be coming to this meeting. And then you go back. Your husband will talk one and you talk ten. Then we need to administer deliverance to you before you go. Because it means you are not catching the spirit of apostolic women. We are talking about excellence here. And that excellence must get even into your home. Hallelujah. So be used to compliments, you know. Let compliments fill your mouth. Good things. Sometimes when people hear people say good things to each other, they say, ah, those people now Oibo, no Oibo couple. There's nothing Oibo about talking nicely to each other. It's Bible culture. It's not Oibo culture. Because you have heard me several times read from Song of Solomon where a man is toasting his wife or where a woman is toasting her husband. I will still read some of them today. Because I know there are so many people who are here who have never come to this conference for the first time. And some people think that it's carnality to compliment their husbands when they say sweet things, honey, darling. There are even people who are here who don't have any pet name for their husbands. Let them raise their hand. Where are they? Those who are in the group of Papa Emeka, Papa Ngozi. Where are they? Raise your hand. They are not here. Okay, they said they did not come. Are you sure? <laughs> so everybody who is here, you have a sweet pet name for your sweetie. Eh? And don't feel, don't be ashamed to compliment your husband. There's nothing to be ashamed about there. Because if you hold those compliments, someone out there might be waiting to release it. These are no longer the days, you know, of being foolish. Whereby some women will say, well, me, I don't want to carry out my responsibility towards my husband, though. He's a man of God. Anyhow, no shaking, no shaking. Eh? You are the only one still in the fool's paradise. If you are in that level. Because now you can see so many men of God have even been derailed. Including big, big bishops and big, big apostles. Have been derailed by strange daughters, 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 daughters hanging around them. The name of daughter, 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 my spiritual daughter, my spiritual daughter. Before you know it, they start telling another story. Are you not hearing? Is it only me that is hearing? Yeah, you better wake up. Wake up. Don't be in a fool's paradise. Step into your place and do what you ought to do to take care of your husband. He's your king and that's the only one you have. Take good care of him. Those compliments you are holding, they are not needed when you live here because there's no marriage in heaven. Take good care of him here. While on earth. So I will read one or two verses from Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon chapter 7. From verse 1. This is a man toasting his bride. How beautiful are your feet in sandals. Oh, princess daughter. The curves of your ties, they are like jewels. 
the work of the hands of a skillful workman. Your navel is like a rounded goblet. It lacks no blended beverage. Your waist is as a heap of wheat set about with lilies. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. Your neck is like an ivory tower. Your eyes are like the pools in Heshbon. This statue of yours is like a palm tree. And your breast like its clusters. It's in the Bible. Are they showing it? Okay. So I don't think mommy is reading from her head. You know, for Jehovah himself to have allowed us to read such scriptures. For them to put it for him to allow it to be in the Bible. That means there's something he wants us to learn from it. Yes, it's not just about the Shunammite woman and Solomon. It means we too can learn from it how to release compliments on our spouses. Because it's very possible. Song of Solomon chapter 4 verse 9. You have ravished, ravished my heart. My sister, my spouse. You have ravished my heart. With one look of your eyes, with one link of your necklace. How fair is your love, my sister, my spouse? How much better than wine is your love? And the scent of your perfume, better than all spices. Your lips, oh my spouse, is dripping like a honeycomb. Some of us, where their lips, they release poison. Receive healing in the name of Jesus. Your lips is not supposed to release poison towards your husband or your children. It should drip like a honeycomb. That is God's desire for your lips. Honey and milk are under your tongue. The fragrance of your garment is like the fragrance of Lebanon. And some of you who have natural scent that is on the other side. You know what I mean? Some people have terrible body odor. It's so strong that they step into this place. The, the fragrance, not fragrance, the odor coming out from them, oozing out, fills that whole environment. And even after they have left, 10, 20 minutes after they have left, their presence remains in that place. And such people don't even believe that you can use a beautiful fragrance, that you can use a good perfume. What is wrong with perfume? It was perfume that that woman came and broke costly perfume at the feet of Jesus and used and anointed him. It was a costly oil. You know? It was a costly oil. And I think the scripture is it. Proverbs 22 or so, verse 1, that talks about a good name being better than riches. And then the next uh, thing to it, something about perfume. You know? Okay, no, not this one. But there's a scripture that says something about perfume. So you don't stay in one place and then you know you have such odors to deal with. And then sometimes such women don't even take their time to bed and clean up properly. And then when you're, you come to bed, you finish all your day's work, sweat, 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 ooze out, ooze out that dirty odor. And then you come to bed with that kind of body. Hey! And then if the man is led in the night to do something, and he turns like this, the thing will just ooze out. Hey! In his heart, he will say, blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus. He had already touched you, meaning to do something. He will say, sorry, 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 sorry. Now my man, he just mistake. Then tomorrow, you come and tell, eh, mommy did. Mommy, my husband has not touched me for the past six months. My husband has not touched Are you touchable? <laughs> Take care of yourself. And make yourself touchable. And you see him being attracted to you. So we're talking about appreciating, respecting, complimenting and admiring your spouse. We don't have time. It doesn't mean that women cannot admire. I think Song of Solomon 5 verse 10 is about the woman toasting the husband. But we need to run because we want to cover enough grounds before we start praying. Number four, flee from infidelity both ways. Both ways because these days infidelity is not only a man's thing. There are some women in the name of preparing for August meeting. That are also into infidelity. They go all lengths to make sure that they meet up with the trend out there. Infidelity is the act of not being faithful to your wife or your husband or partner by having sex with someone else. It's one of the most painful experiences in marriage. When a spouse discovers that his partner has been unfaithful, 
the emotional trauma that he lives in your heart. It takes only Jehovah to heal you. And sometimes those kind of healings do not like just come overnight. It takes counsel from a mentor, from a father or mother who knows what to do. And then prayers for a while before you get healed. Sexual union is considered very sacred. And God doesn't want us to toy with our sexuality at all. Paul emphasized it in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 15. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of an high Lord? God forbid. Know ye not that he who is joined to an harlot is one body with the harlot. For two, said he, shall become one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Therefore, flee fornication. Every sin that the man doeth is without the body. But he that committed fornication sinned against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you. Which, is of, which you have of God, and that you are not your own. For you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So flee, flee. For everything the Bible asks you to run away from, fornication. Fornication is not something that is facing you. And while you are there, be tempted to do it. You are busy speaking in tongues. Hey, that time you are taking to speak in tongues. Flee! That's what the Bible says. Run! As fast as your legs can carry you. Run! Run! Before you endanger your soul. Proverbs 5 verse 15. Drink water from your own system. Running water from your own well. Should your fountain be dispersed abroad. Streams of water in the streets. Let them be only your own and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed. Rejoice with the wife of your youth. As a loving dear and a graceful doe. Let her breast satisfy you always. And always be enraptured with her love. And why would thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman? And embrace the bosom of a stranger. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 23. I love this one. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is a light. Reproofs of instruction are the ways of life to keep you from the evil woman, from the fat, flattering tongue of a seductress. Don't lust after her beauty in your heart, nor let her allure you with her eyelids. For by means of a harlot, a man is reduced to a loaf of bread. And an adulteress will pray upon his precious life. Can a man take fire to his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be seared? So is he who goes into his neighbor's wife. Whoever touches her shall not be innocent. Hmm. Take down this other scripture. You can read it when you get home. Proverbs 6, 32 to 33. But I want to read this one. Proverbs 7, 21 to 23, and then 26 to 27. With her enticing speech, she caused him to yield. With her flattering lips, she seduced him. Immediately he went after her. As an ox goes to the slaughter, as a fool to the correction of the stock. Till an arrow struck his liver. As a bird hasted to the snare, he did not know it would cost his life. Verse 26, for she has cast down many wounded. And all who were slain by her were strong men. Her house is the way to hell, descending to the chambers of death. I don't know whether you know that in this season, we are not just having sugar daddies. There are also sugar mummies. There are also Geo's wives or lady Geo's who are into immorality. And they grab these young, young people and enslave them and make them you know, to be ministering to their sexual needs. They have reduced themselves to a loaf of bread. And they have messed up their lives and destiny. Any of us who is here 
and you are battling with that kind of rubbish. Or your husband is battling with strange women, you know, syndrome. He's battling with infidelity. Because the Lord is on this altar, and because it's an altar of deliverance, we are reproaches that run away, and kings and queens are made. I release deliverance in the name of Jesus. I break that wicked spell over your life and over the life of your husband. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Number five, enjoy your everyday life. Enjoy your everyday life. Be happy. You and your husband, enjoy your everyday life. Ecclesiastes 9.9. 9. You know, it says we should live joyfully with the wife whom we love all the days of our life, which God has given us under the sun. For this is our portion in the labor that we perform under the sun. So, work on enjoying your marriage. You work at it. You don't just lie on your ivory bed and your marriage becomes exciting and you begin to enjoy it. Marriage is like a garden. It needs to be tended. You know, if you don't tend it, it will grow stars, weeds. So every day, you know, remove the stars. The Bible says, while men slept, while men slept, the enemy came and sold stars. Some of our marriages are going through attack because we've been sleeping on duty. Sleeping spiritually, sleeping emotionally, sleeping physically. You've been sleeping on duty. While men slept, the enemy came and sold tasks. God expects you to enjoy your marriage. It's meant to be enjoyed, not endured. Be excited, hanging out with each other. Be happy with yourself. But you have to work at it. You have to work at it. Tend that garden of your marriage. Be sweet and tender to your spouse. Express love to your spouse in practical terms. First John chapter 3 verse 18. The Bible says, let us not love in words or just with tongue. Let us love in deed and in truth. Many of you have heard that funny story that daddy told us of two lovebirds. One was in the bush and one was by the roadside. The one in the bush was calling out to the one on the roadside. Hello, bird. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. The one up there in the tree says, show it. Show it. Show it. When you say you love your husband, do what? Show it. Show it. If you move around this camp to the marketplace everywhere, you'll find beautiful things. Women, before you go home, even if it is not something very expensive, pick a little thing. Pick something that you can take home to your sweetie. I said, this is what I bought for you from the conference. Of course, I know everybody is taking home at least the, 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 the flash of the messages, you know. You take one home that both of you can be listening to. And then, of course, those who are part of the, 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 the COC and all that will be posting the messages. You can send the link to your husband wherever he is. He can connect with what God is doing here. Show love in practical terms. Remember important days of your life that need to be celebrated. Don't just allow Father's Day to pass unnoticed. Don't just allow your anniversaries to pass unnoticed. Don't allow his bad day to pass unnoticed. The Bible talks about the tent of the righteous. There's supposed to be shouts of rejoicing, shouts of celebration in the tents of the righteous of the Lord. Because the Lord's right hand is always doing mighty things for the righteous. So keep your home happy and excited. Let there be celebration day and night in your home. Be in a hurry to give. When the Bible says give and it shall be given to you, it's not just talking about, you know, giving money. You can give love. You can give attention. You can give kindness. You can give a helping hand. You can give understanding. You can give courtesy. You can give respect. Give! And it shall be given to you. Good measure, press down, shaking together and running over. Acts chapter 20 verse 35b. He said it is more blessed to give than to receive. So if you're not receiving love from your husband, if you are one of those women that is, you know, experiencing disfavor towards him, from him. And year in, year out, it doesn't give you even a handkerchief. Do you know you can break that 
by beginning to sow yourself into his life. No matter how little it is. It could be a way of teaching him that it's good to give. Take something, pray over it, and give to him. Daddy, I just brought you this. Sweetie, I decided to give you this. He may do like, it's not a big deal. Uh, what is that? I better keep it. No problem. Continue. One day you will have a breakthrough. You'll be able to pierce through into his heart. Don't get discouraged. Because sometimes some of these things can be very discouraging. And then of course not that you are the one responsible for your joy in your home. Don't give that responsibility to your husband. The Bible says, Nehemiah 8 verse 10 be, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Preserve your joy. Joy is not the absence of challenges. That you are joyful does not mean you have no issue. In your marriage, there's actually no marriage that doesn't have issue in one way or the other. There are always small, small challenges here and there. But joy is the presence of God in the midst of the storm. The fact that you are seeing the storm, but you are rejoicing in the, in the presence of the storm. Paul said to the Thessalonian Christians, rejoice in the Lord always. And I say again, rejoice. Rejoice. Don't let anything tamper with your joy. Even if there's a problem, even if there's a storm raging in your home, don't see your husband as the cause of that storm. See the devil behind it. And of course, remember that the Almighty is for you. If God be for you, who can be against you? The Bible says, I think it's Psalm 107, verse 20 or something like that. I'm not too sure. No, no, no. Psalm 107, verse 20, the one that says, he sent forth his word and he healed them. I think it's verse 29 or so. That says, he comes every storm to a whisper. God has a way of coming whatever storm is raging in your home. And from this altar, I declare every storm that is raging in any home represented here. Be calmed down in the name of Jesus. Because the stealer of storm is in the house. Jesus is the one that comes every storm to a whisper. So let nobody hear you nagging and complaining and, you know, criticizing. Every day you are murmuring. No, 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 no. Stop murmuring. Stop murmuring. You may not have reached your promised land, but at least you have left your Egypt and you're making progress. Rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Proverbs 17, 22. It says, a merry heart does good like medicine. Don't let anybody steal your joy. Don't let anything steal your joy. Be cheerful and be happy. Isaiah 65, verse 21 to 23. The Bible says, we shall build houses and we shall inhabit them. We will plant vineyards and we will eat the fruit thereof. We shall not build and another inhabit. Can I hear an amen? amen? We shall not plant and another eat. Can you say a thunderous amen? amen? For as the days of a tree, so are the days of my people. And my elect shall live long to enjoy the work of their hands. Hallelujah. Verse 23 says, you shall not labor in vain. You shall not labor in vain. You will never be a children that are doomed to misfortune. You will not be a children that are doomed to misfortune. Because your children will be a people blessed by the Lord. They and their descendants with him. Hallelujah. Number six. Forgive your spouse easily. And learn to apologize. Be in a hurry. So forgive. Stop heaping, heaping those misunderstandings. Stop heaping them. Stop heaping them. You know? And accumulating bitterness. 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 It doesn't help you. It's an excess luggage. It does not help you. If anything, it weighs you down like an excess luggage on your journey of life. Let go. Marriage is a union of two good forgivers. Two good forgivers. That's what marriage is. Let go. Let go. And let God have his way. Be in a hurry to forgive. Let those words, I am sorry. I am sorry, please forgive me. Let them always be on your lips. 
Colossians chapter 3 verse 13. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Refuse to be controlled by your emotions. Refuse to be angry forever. Doesn't matter what your husband has done to you. Some of you came to this conference wounded in your heart. That's what the Lord said. And in your heart it's like, you don't know what this man has done to me. You don't know how this man has, has, has caused so much pain in my heart. Can I tell you that the Lord knows about that pain? Can I tell you that the Lord knows that you brought that pain to this meeting? And let me assure you, you are not going back home with that pain. In the name of Jesus. Part of the reason why God brought you here is to heal you. From here, you will be so healed that you send a text to your husband home. and Say, honey, I just want you to know I have forgiven you. I no longer hold it in my heart against you. I'm not saying what he did to you is good. But I'm saying that you are better off forgiving him than carrying it in your heart. Because Number seven. Speak life-giving words to your spouse. Learn effective communication in your marriage. Speak life-giving words to your spouse. And learn to communicate effectively. You know, with one another. Communication is the life wire of any relationship. Communication is to marriage. What blood is to the body. So learn how to communicate and communicate effectively. Apply wisdom in your communication with your husband. In communication, there are three aspects. What you say forms only 7%. Of the communication. The tone of your voice. Forms about 30 something percent. Of the communication. And then your. Your non-verbal. You know gesticulations. The way you kept your face. When you were communicating. How you were throwing your hands here and there. Those non-verbal. Signs. Forms almost 55 percent. Of your communication. So choose the tone. The right tone. Of course, choose the right place. Also, choose the right time to communicate. When a man just comes back from work and he's so hungry, wants to eat, it's not the time you tell him about children's school fees. You don't welcome a man to the house with children's school fees or with the fact that there's no food in the house. Whatever had been available, put it together. Take care of him first. Let him eat and settle down. Drink water, drop cup. <laughs> When he's relaxing, now he's happy. Now you've taken care of his stomach. And then you can bring up your needs. I think it will receive a better attention that way. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29, he says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But let that which will come forth from your mouth be that which is worthy of edification. Let it build your husband up. Don't always use your mouth to paralyze him. Some of us will know how to paralyze our spouses with the things we say. You finish addressing your husband. You know, women are gifted. When it comes to talking, we are gifted, over gifted. Hey, some women here, when they open their mouth, it's like a tap. You will now be begging them to close the tap. <laughs> The same communication book I was reading some time ago. It says the average woman has the ability to speak 25,000 words in a day. Whereas the average man, no matter how hard he tries, can only speak 12,500 words in a day. Women, at least we take that one past them. Can you celebrate your talking, your talking grace? Eh? Celebrate your talking ability. <laughs> but now, you've got to be careful what you say. Before you end for yourself a good slap. Power! We talk of domestic violence, domestic violence. So many of the domestic violence. Now we, they call some. A woman no get strength. But you get mouth to talk. And then your husband will say one. You say ten. The man will get angry. Because you have finished him. 
He's not looking at himself. He's like, am I still a man? This woman has abused life out of me. Out of that anger. You do what? Power. Hey, you kill me today. You kill me today. You carry your head tie. Put for west. No strength. No ten couple strength. Now just mouth. Now you get. Hey. May the Lord heal our mouth too. Father, heal my mouth. Pray for yourself. Father, heal my mouth. That I will speak only things that they defy. Things that will build up. And minister grace. In the name of Jesus. Proverbs chapter 13 verse 3. He that keepeth his mouth... Keep it his life. But he that open it wide his mouth invites destruction. Hey! Um, why? Proverbs 31 verse 26. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of a divine that it may minister grace to the hearers. Number eight. Submit yourself one to another. Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 21, that's what that scripture says. Submitting yourself one to another. And then 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 to 2. This one is basically to the woman. To submit to the authority of our husbands. In like manner, you married women. Be submissive to your own husbands. Subordinate yourselves as being secondary to. And dependent on. This is amplified version. And adapt yourselves to them. So that even if any of them do not obey the word of God, they may be won over, not by discussion, but by the godly lives of their wives. When they observe the pure, modest way in which you conduct yourselves, together with your reverence for your husband, you are to feel for him all that reverence includes, to respect him, to defer to him, to revive him, to honor him, to esteem him, to appreciate him, to prize him highly and in human sense to adore him which means to admire, to praise, to be devoted to, to deeply love and enjoy your husband. I love this translation. I love this translation. If you understand it from this angle, submission will not be an issue. Because sometimes when we talk about submission, you think it's one you know, devilish yoke that they put upon womanhood. No! Submission does not mean you don't have a say in your marriage. Submission simply means you have a right to air your views, to tell your husband your opinion when he asks for it, when he asks for it. But then allow him to take the final decision. That is simple, what submission is about. Don't force your suggestion down his throat. And then, he must not take your opinion. If you suggest that he says, no, I don't want to do it like that, leave it. Even if you feel in your spirit that that is what God wants you to do, go back to your closet and begin to pray. That's why you should have a closet life. A solid closet life. A solid praying life. Then the next point I want to mention is both of you build on your work with God. As you build your home, build also on your work with God. Because you need to build your work with God. It's very important. Build up your work with God. <coughs> build up your work with God. Personally, some of you think that because you're married to a man of God, who is always studying, always praying, and you don't study, you don't pray. Whenever he lies with you in the bed, he will just transfer all the anointing in his life into your life. It does not work like that. It's, it's not that easy. Build up your most holy faith yourself. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Study the word of God to be approved. A workman that does not need to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Study. Study the word of God. Have a closet life. Be disciplined. To know what time you need to spend with God. Very, very important. Very, very important. 
Keep the right company. Yesterday we talked about company. Keep the right company because the company you keep, it shapes your habits. It shapes your thoughts. It shapes your actions. It shapes, it shapes even the things you say. If you hang out with divorcees, people who have no value for husbands. And in their midst, you're always talking about my husband, my husband. They will shut you down. I beg, allow us to hear. Now only you get husband. What is that? You know? I've said it before from this altar. That there's an association in America, in a place they call California. That is called Association of Christian Divorcees. And they go out and converse for members. And what do they do? What is their agenda? They encourage women not to hang out with one husband forever. They are bold to tell you that um, I'm married to my fourth husband. I'm in my fifth marriage. God is a God of second chance. And then they'll ask you, how long have you been married? Say, 10 years. And they say, how many husbands? They say, ah, only one husband now. One husband for 10 years. Rubbish. What are you doing there? Are you not tired of one man for 10 years? Me, I'm in my fifth husband. Me, I'm in my sixth marriage. And for them, it's a thing of pride that they are, you know, international prostitutes going from one man to another. Don't hang out with such people who have no value for the sanctity of marriage. Quite before you know it, they'll corrupt you and talk, talk down on your relationship with your husband. And make you begin to look at your husband as somebody who is not worth even a rag. When you company with wise people, you'll be wise. When you company with fools, you'll be destroyed. That's why if you're part of this altar, you have no reason to have a bad marriage. No reason whatsoever. Because we don't only have a good marriage as the priest manning this altar. But we also pray for all our sons and daughters and their homes. Steadily asking the Lord to sweeten their own marriages. Because we desire that your marriages can even be sweeter than ours. Every good parent want their children to be better than them. So you cannot be coming to an altar like this. There's hardly any conference. We don't talk about marriage. Because we believe in the sanctity of marriage. We believe in marriage being exciting. We believe in you enjoying your marriage. You cannot be coming to an altar like this and you go back home and you are living like cat and dog with your husband. It's an error. Somebody say, error! error. It's not your portion in the name of Jesus. And then it's important that you take care of yourself in a way that you remain attractive to each other. Take good care of yourself. Whatever you need to do, Take good care of yourself. Your appearance is important. Whereas the scripture said, let our donning not just be that of wearing gold and uh, you know, um, apparel and good clothes and all that. It does not mean that you should not go naked. You will still wear good clothes. But then there is something on the inside that is more important than the, gold, the gro uh, clothes that you are wearing. The content is more important than the container. However, you need to clothe the container as well. So take care of your body. Be, be good, you know, be, be sure you're in good health. Many of us, women in particular, we go through burnout. We stress ourselves so much. At the end of the day, we are so worn out. We are busy taking care of husband. We take care of children. We take care of family. We do this. We do that. That is okay. But in the midst of all of that, make room for me. Me time is important. Take care of yourself. Because if they look for you tomorrow and you're not there, your husband may not remain a widower forever. If he manages amongst you for six months, one year, he will move on. And then you would have wasted your life. You would have died before your time. You would have labored in vain on the day when your children are being celebrated. Now a representative that calls herself stepmother will not be there to represent you. It is not your portion. It will never happen. You will be alive to enjoy the fruit of your labor. On the day they will be celebrated, you will be there alive and direct. In the name of Jesus. Be on the same page with your husband regarding parenting. This afternoon we are going to be you know, listening to a message about fighting for the destiny 
of our children. So I'm not going to flog that point because I want us to begin to pray in the next four minutes. But let it be that both of you are on the same page regarding parenting your children. Handle your finances with maturity because that's another area. Money, money is such a strong force. You know that the Bible calls it a God, a mammon. If you don't handle it well, it can scatter your home and make it not to be interesting. Come up with creative ideas that you can use to spice your marriage. There are so many creative ideas. Practical things you can be doing to make your marriage exciting. You know, you can decide to go to gym together and have fun exercising your bodies. You can also use some exercising gadgets at home. Some of us have treadmill at home. We have bicycling, you know, bicycle gadgets at home and all that. Just have fun having exercise together. You can decide to take a leisure walk around where you are, you know, in your neighborhood. It can be a leisure walk where you're just going and you're talking and chatting and enjoying yourself, enjoying the company of one another. You can also make it a prayer walk. You are moving around and you're praying or listening to a message or listening to a worship song together. You know, it gives a soothing feeling. Sometimes you can just stay in front of the TV and decide to have your own movie night. Put on something that is a defying, that is interesting, that is relaxing, that you want to watch. And just stay together, holding each other's, you know, in your arms. And just enjoy your own movie night. You know, from time to time, try feeding each other. Some of us, we just did it once on the wedding day. Since that day, you have never fed your husband. They did not say it should be done only on wedding day. After wedding day, don't feed again. <laughs> a, a brother, one of, one of our sons in ministry, the wife was trying to feed him in the house. There are two children, two boys we are watching. And then she would take the food and put it in the husband's mouth. And the son said, ah, ah daddy, what is that? Uh, are you a small boy that mommy is feeding you? <laughs> uh, mommy, stop that. Instead of feeding us, you are feeding daddy. Daddy is a big man. <laughs> but I mean, they learned that they are not doing it because daddy is a small boy. It's just fun feeding each other. From time to time, you know, just, just try to look into each other's eyes. And admire each other. Admire certain things in the lives of each other. You know? And then, from time to time, get a massage. You know? Give yourselves a massage. If you don't know how to do it, you can learn. Go to the internet. You'll learn how to massage. You know? Get a good massaging oil. I knew my sweetie was very tired. Kind of. Before we started coming to this conference. Because of so much he's been doing. I said, honey... I'm going to give you a massage, two solid days massage before you go for this conference. So, he would just lie down and then I thoroughly go, you know, one level after another. I gave him good massage. That night he slept so well. The next day is the one that reminded me, when are you giving me another massage? <laughs> because he knows how he felt. You know, this thing that goes stress can kill. Do you know that? So, no allow him from time to time. You know, remove it. Take away that stress by doing some of these little things, you know, for each other. It doesn't cost any much. And yet, it has a way of gluing you together with each other. Sometimes you can just try and go for a picnic, you know. Go for a picnic somewhere. Take your sandwich or go there and eat bole. Just something different, something different. Sometimes, especially if you're living alone, you can decide to go and sleep in another room. Just travel. From one room to another. Travel. And just go there and have a good time. You know? Sometimes you can decide to dance for each other. My husband's best times are the times I dance for him. Sometimes I just, I just wake up and I begin to dance. And he's watching me and he's smiling and laughing. And I'm dancing different styles. He said, this thing you're doing here, your women will not know that you do like this in the bedroom. I said, they don't need to know. I'm dancing for my king. I'm dancing for my sweetie. You know, do some things to give your marriage some excitement. Eh? Enjoy this life. Uh, some of you are so intense about life. Eh? You are going to heaven, but you are utterly useless. Eh? You don't want to do anything for here to make this life exciting. God said in my presence, there is fullness of joy. And his presence should also be in your home. 
And in that presence of the Lord, you should enjoy life. Make your marriage as romantic as possible. Romance is not sex. Romance is just that sweet atmosphere that you can create in your home that makes marriage exciting. Make your marriage exciting. Huh? There are so many things you can do to make your marriage romantic. Compliments. Compliment each other often. Say good things to each other. Nice things. It doesn't cost you anything. Write some sweet notes from time to time. We are so blessed in this season with GSM. It's not like in our days when we used to write, you know, pick your golden pen and write those golden words and go to post office and post it. Eh? As it's burning in your heart, before it will reach your sweetie, the thing will already die here. And then he himself will pick it up and then it will burn in his heart. He will reply and send before it gets here. It will already die. But now with GSM, eh? as you are here now in this conference, any little opportunity you find, you can just send a text to your sweetie and say, sweetie, how are you doing? The thing where we're here for here. Hey! In fact, wait for me. I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm coming back. Wait for me. I will take good care of you. You know, last year when I was preaching, was it last year or January? <laughs> when I was talking about marriage, and then I think it was Venerable Doe that was coordinating. From here, he told his wife, he said, eh, I will show you. Did you hear what mommy said? He said, we should take good care of our wives. Just get ready for me. I will show you. <laughs> oh, my God. That was really exciting. You know, so there are many things you can do to make your marriage romantic. As often as you can, hug each other. Eh? There's so much scarcity of spousal hug these days. You hardly see spouses hugging each other. What is wrong with us? Eh? What is wrong with us? Hug each other. So when you don't hug your husband, he doesn't hug you. When another brother now hugs you, you go hold him tight. Eh? Make you recover the one way your husband no, no give you. It's not the same. Husband's hug and another man's hug, they no be the same. Rekindle that hug, that hug. It can be bedroom hug. It can be goodbye hug. It can be good morning hug. Hug each other on a daily basis. Very important. Touch each other. Any kind of touch. Anywhere you want to touch, you are free. Depending on where you are. <laughs> because there are places you don't touch in the public. <laughs> but those places, you are free to touch them in the private. Because there is no part of the body that is a snake that bites. Every part is okay to be touched. You understand what I'm saying? You are free to touch. Touch each other. Smile at each other. Because when you stop smiling at each other, your marriage is already smelling. When each time you see each other, you're no longer excited. Something is wrong. As I'm talking right now, all of you know I love my sweetie of no regret. You know it. I don't hide it. If as I'm talking now, my sweetie walks in here, you will not say my sweetie don't come. I will definitely be excited seeing him any day. So when it, you see each other, you're no longer excited. Something is already wrong. With that marriage. Talk to each other on a daily basis. Let no day pass. If it's not with you, you can chat. These days, they made it easy for us. You can even finish chatting. And then you put that heart. You know that heart, that red heart that will be bob. You know, to just be doing like, where blood is pumping. Boom, 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 boom. You know it, right? All of you who use phone, you know what I'm talking about. And then there could be some kisses. You released your sweetie. There is no reason. Why any home, any marriage should not be romantic? There is no reason for that. Take good care of your spouse. Then, of course, make your sexual life exciting. Make your sexual life exciting. Part of romance is also keeping yourself fit. I mentioned it before. Dress well. Eat well. Lose weight. If you are heavy and you need to lose weight, because sometimes you may want to carry you. Some of the men, our husbands carried us on our wedding day. And now when they look at us again, they can't even attempt it because if they want to carry you, they'll break their waist. <laughs> Try and shed small. Overweight is not a wonderful thing. Did you hear me? It's possible to shed weight. At least I know it's possible to shed weight. By this time last year, I was weighing 90. 
I told myself I need to work on this weight before I become Mama Iyabo. And then I started working on it. I said, today, I'm weighing 82. In fact, the, when I checked last before I came here, I had come down to 80. And I have only five more kg to be done. And my people are saying, no, mommy, don't come down beyond this. Don't come down. They will now be asking, oh, where is your mother? And they'll be looking for you. I said, nobody will look for me. <laughs> I want to lose weight. Nobody will look for me. <laughs> Share it small. It's possible. It's a matter of determination. And it's a matter of discipline. And then, of course, let your sexual life be exciting. Because that is the will of God for you. For your sexual life to be exciting. Make it fun. Make it enjoyable. Put life in it. Sexual harmony is a possibility. And it's a must for every couple. So don't settle down for mediocrity. When God has made available for you something better. Make out time and effort to learn how you can get the best from your sexual relationship with your husband. Because sex is so important. It relaxes your nervous system after a hectic day that is loaded with pleasure, uh, pressure. And then it provides an oasis in the midst of the tumult and mundaneness of everyday living. It provides an oasis, you know, that will just take away every stress that you have gone through. There are many, you know, few things I want to mention about sex. It also, you know, gives you an opportunity to reassure each other how much you love yourself. And brings you into a state of intimacy with each other that nothing can ever bring you into that state. And helps you also to have a revelation of how God himself wants us to be intimate with him. Sex is not carnal. carnal. Sex is holy. Sex is good. The Bible says every good thing and every perfect thing is from above. Including sex. James chapter 1 verse 17. So it is among those good things that came from above. And sex is private. It's not something you do in the open. It's something you do behind closed doors. Sex colors marriage. And marriage colors sex. God is not embarrassed by sex. You need to know. He's not embarrassed by it. He's there when you are doing it. That's why in the book of Genesis 38 verse 9 to 10. The Bible talks about how eh, Judas firstborn. Who was wicked. God slew him. And then Judas said to Onan. Go into your brother's wife. Marry her. Raise seed for your brother. Onan knew that the seed will not be his. It came to pass. He went to his brother's wife. Enjoyed himself. And when it was time to release seed, he came out and he spilled it on the ground. And God said, you are a wicked man. If you didn't want to give your brother seed, you shouldn't even have enjoyed yourself with his wife. So you went and enjoyed yourself. When it was time to release seed, you came out and spilled it on the ground. And God killed him on the spot. If God was not supervising the event, how would he have known what they did? So those of you who think that sex is what you do when God is not looking, you are wasting your time over. Because God is looking. And that's why some of you only do it when Nepal takes light. You don't want to do it when you, your husband can see you and you can see your husband. And it's like, I bet do, do, do before God goes see us. Make it be said we don't finish. Relax. God is there. He's watching what is happening. So every one time when you defraud your husband of sex and tell him, my head, my shoulder, my knee, my toe, everywhere is spending me. God will mark it for you in your report card. I saw it. Tomorrow again, you say, my head, my shoulder, my knee, my toe. He will mark it again in your report card. And you man that just jumps up like a rider on top of a horse. You don't follow procedure in the matter. You don't know there is a protocol in lovemaking. Eh? You just see your wife coming out naked from the bedroom. You're already ready. Everything inside of you is shaking like this. And you grab her, madam, lie well. You don't finish, yo. All the toasting will be in there, your mouth says. You never, you know, you don't forget all of them. Madam, lie where? Oh, girl, lie here. And then before you know it, right on top of a horse, you're already heading to the promised land. Before you know it, you have already reached the promised land and you will disembark. And the woman is like, has he started? What is happening here? She doesn't even know where you started. You had me, you've had me preach it here severally. And it's in the book, Killing the Marriage Killers. One whole chapter is talking about the fellowship of lovemaking. It's a fellowship. And it has its own procedure and protocol. 
if you look at the Bible, I don't know whether it's Song of Solomon 2 verse 5. Check it out, whether it's in the scripture. It tells you the position self of romance in bed with his left hand under my head and then with his right hand caressing me. It's in your Bible, oh. It's not? Yes, yeah, so I got it. Okay. Song of Solomon 2 verse 6. His left hand is under my head and his right hand does embrace me. Certain translations will say his right hand caresses me. So that is God's will that you should enjoy. Enjoy sexual life in bed. In the, in the fellowship of the bedroom, there is a, a, a place and a room for what? Opening prayer. There's a room for praise and worship. There's a room for testimonies. There's a room for even special number. Take time to toast each other. Take time to explore each other's body. It's part of it. Nobody sealed your mouth and said, once we come to bed, don't talk. Open your mouth and tell your husband, this is how you will touch me and I, I will enjoy it. If you do like this, I will enjoy it. I will get to the Holy of Holies. Talk! They did not say you shouldn't talk. And then you are able to take that journey together. And then you are preparing the way for the man of God to appear to preach the word. Man of God, don't just appear like that. You are too precious to just appear like that. And be like a rider riding on top of a horse. Take your time. Wait for your turn. When it is time, then the woman's body has been prepared for you. Then you can appear and preach the word. When you preach it at the right time, you preach it with anointing. And then you'll be able to carry your wife together to the promised land. So that next time when you need her, she will not close the, 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 the Holy of Holies and not give you access because you don't know how to do it. When you do it well, you don't even need to apply for visa. Once you look at her, she already knows what you need. She'll say, oh boy, what do you want? And she will give you access to the Holy of Holies. When you finish ministering at that anointed level, don't forget to share the grace in fellowship before you disembark. When you practice it like that, oh, you can even be at that level and be blowing in tongues, both of you. And you see every demon flying out from wherever. Because there, that level of unity, nothing can be compared with it. And God values that level of unity. Finally, you want to have an exciting marriage. Fight for it. Fight for it. It doesn't just drop from heaven. You have to fight for your marriage to become exciting. Nehemiah chapter 4, I think it's verse 14b. God was speaking to Israel through Nehemiah. He said, tell them to fight for their sons and daughters. Today we are going to be listening to a message. Fight for the destinies of your children. Immediately after now, that's the next message. He said, fight, fight. For, your, for your, your brothers. Fight for your sons. Fight for your daughters. Fight for your wives. And fight for your homes. Having a good home is a fight. You've got to pray. See it as part of your spiritual warfare. And today, we are going to fight. To take that which belongs to us. And of course, we're living here with our possession. In the name of Jesus Christ. Rise up on your feet. We want to pray. Hallelujah. Rise up on your feet quickly. We're just going to take a few prayer points and then I will call up Mommy Deet to take over. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The Lord told me that so many people came here with all kinds of reproach on their life. Reproaches on their life. Some of them are appearing names. They are not supposed to be here. Some are, you know, carrying like a, like a badge of disfavor on them. There's nothing they do that pleases their husbands. They do like this, he will say no. They will do like this, he will say no. And they are carrying that badge of disfavor. Some are looking for the fruit of the womb. Some are carrying a big bad name from in-laws. But whatever your reproach is, the Lord said, today there is healing in the house. And all those reproaches will be rolled away in the name of Jesus. In Luke chapter 1 verse 36 and 37. 
Now, Elizabeth, your relation has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Somebody said, with God, nothing shall be impossible. So every form of reproach that has stigmatized your destiny, stolen your real name, giving you an identity that is not you. Today, heaven is set to roll away such reproaches in the name of Jesus. This is Gilgal. We are reproaches that roll away. And kings and queens, amen. Therefore, say with me every reproach from hell that has stigmatized my life. Today, your assignment is over. You are rolled away in the name of Jesus. Open your mouth and begin to address that reproach. It doesn't matter what kind of reproach it is. Even if it's a reproach coming from your children. Your children are unruly and they're bringing a bad name to the family. He's a reproach. He's a reproach. Every form of disgrace that has harassed your life in the past. He's a reproach. But today, there is mercy in the house. I want to hear you pray. I'm not hearing anybody praying here. Can you open your mouth and pray? Pray like you mean to pray. That reproach that came with you is not going back with you. That reproach is not going back with you. That reproach is not going back with you. The Bible says in the days of John the Baptist, yes, the kingdom of God suffered violence and the violent they take it by force. Address that reproach. Address that reproach. That has taken your name. That has stigmatized you. That reproach. It doesn't matter how long it has lingered. Address it. Address that reproach. Because you are not carrying it out of this place. Can somebody pray? Can you 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 pray? Roll away that reproach. You don't need to carry it back from this altar. You reproach. Your time is over. The fire of the Lord consumes you. Your assignment is over. Your assignment is over. This is Gilgal. We are reproaches are rolled away. Reproach, you are not going back with God's people. You are not going back with us from this altar. In the name of Jesus Christ. Psalm 54 verse 7. The Bible says, he has delivered me out of all my troubles. And my eyes shall see his desire upon my enemies. Hallelujah. Job chapter 5. Verse 19, he said, he shall deliver you in six troubles. Yea, in seven, there shall no evil touch you. Many may be the afflictions of the righteous. But the Bible says, the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Oh, not one of his bones is broken. I don't care what your afflictions may have been. I don't care what kind of troubles you brought to this camp. He that saved you from six trouble, he's here to deliver you even from the seventh trouble. And he will deliver you today in the name of Jesus. Say with me every trouble in and around my life and my destiny. Your assignment is over. Catch fire in the name of Jesus. Open your mouth and pray. Bring that trouble to an end. He has delivered you from six troubles. He's able to deliver you from the seventh one. That reproach you came with. He's been rolled away on this altar. You are not going back with that reproach. You will not take it back home. In the name of Jesus, that reproach is going. That reproach is leaving you. That reproach is leaving you. In the name of Jesus, that reproach is living your life. You are not taking it back. The God of deliverance is here. He has delivered you from six troubles. From this seventh one, it will not swallow you up. In the name of Jesus. I want us to pray for our children wherever they are. I'm sure we are going to pray more for them even in the next session. Because we are going to be fighting over their destinies. But you see, the scripture we read in Isaiah 65 from verse 21 to 23. He said, we will build houses. We will inhabit them. We will plant vineyards and eat the fruit thereof. We will not build and another inhabit. We will not plant and another eat. We will live long 
to enjoy the fruit of our labor. And verse 23 says, we will not labor in vain. We will not bring forth children that will give us high BP. We will not bring forth children that will bring shame and disgrace to the family. We are going to prophesy over the lives of our children. The Bible says in Isaiah 8, 18, they shall be for signs and wonders in the land. Isaiah 69, 60, 61 verse 9. It says, your seed shall be known among the nations. Those who see them will acknowledge them as the seed that God has blessed. Our children are meant to be mighty in the land. They are the generation of the upright and they are blessed. So you're going to mention them by name. Like Job used to pray for his children in those days. He will mention them by name and he will prophesy over their life that they will fulfill their destiny. The call of God for their life will never be aborted. In the name of Jesus. Say with me, my father, my father. Concerning my children. I will never labor in vain. I will not labor in vain. I bring them before you. Mention them by their names. Michael, Michelle and David. And all my spiritual children all over the world. I bring you before the Lord. Begin to prophesy. Prophesy over them. Yes, they shall be known among the nations. Anybody that sees them will acknowledge them as the seed that God has blessed. Yes, they are blessed. They are mighty in the land. They are the generation of the upright. They are blessed. They are sharpened arrows, polished arrows in the quiver of a mighty man. We are blessed because our quiver is full of them. Yes, we will not labor in vain. They will be established right before our eyes. Our children will be established right before our eyes. Our children will be established right before our eyes. Yes, they will be established right before our eyes. Yes, they will be established right before our eyes. Yes, they will be established right before our eyes. In the name of Jesus Christ. I'm going to make a call right now. In the seven minutes we have left. And then if you desire that your marriage from today, you want it to get more exciting. You may have been having a happy marriage, but you want it happier. Or you may have had a marriage that is not really a happy one. But you want it to become happy from today. We are going to prophesy over such marriages. I want you to begin to run out to this altar. As I invite uh, Professor Idi to come back up here. She's going to pray for you. But while you're coming up, please listen to these two scriptures. You want us to pray for your marriage. You want a refreshing and a renewal upon your marriage. You want your marriage to become more exciting. You came here with any wound or pain in your heart regarding your marriage. And you want it rolled away. You want to receive your healing right on this altar. So that you don't go back with that same pain. The Lord is about to do something in your home. And you are going back healed. In the name of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 1.24 it says. Not that we have dominion over your faith. But we are helpers of your joy. But we are helpers of your joy. But we are helpers of your joy. The Bible says in 1 Chronicles 12 verse 22. At that time, day by day, many people came to David. They came to help him until they became a great host. The Lord told me, say to my daughters, I'm releasing to them helpers of joy. Destiny helpers. I don't know what you have been through. But the Lord wants to release upon your marriage and upon your life. Destiny, help us. Help us of your joy. And then of course, there is a fragrance that the Lord wants to release upon your home and upon your marriage. You find that in Song of Solomon 4 verse 16. He says, awake, oh not wind. Rise up, you south wind. Blow on my garden. And spread this fragrance all around. Some of you who have suffered disfavor from your husbands. Today, a fragrance is coming upon your life. You are going out from this camp with a sweet fragrance upon your life. The Lord is compassing you about with favor. He 
in the name of Jesus. Amen. Places you have gone to and you were rejected, you will go back and you will be received warmly. Amen. Where you have been tolerated, you will go back and become a celebrity. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Begin to pray. Pray over your marriage. Pray over your home. Begin to prophesy. Prophesy that sweet fragrance of the Lord that has already been released. Lord, release that sweet fragrance upon my life. Release it upon my home. Release favor, 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 unusual favor. I need your favor upon my life, upon my home. Your favor, your favor, your favor, your favor, your favor, your favor, your favor. When you show mercy to a woman, you release favor. Lord, it is time to arise and favor these daughters. Our time of favor is here. Nobody who came with this favor will go back with this favor. Everyone who came with pain in their heart, they are going back healed. Lord, breathe upon your daughters. Breathe upon your daughters. Release favor. Unusual favor. Unusual fragrance upon everyone that is here. Lord God, thank you for what you have already begun to do. Thank you for what you already began to do. Professor Git, come up, please. we look to you. We look to you, the one who instituted marriage. We look to you, the God who knows our frame. We look to you, the Lord who takes note of the quantity of the volume of tears that flow from our eyes. You understand the pain that some of these your daughters go through. The pain that they cannot explain. You know the issues that they cannot even tell their mothers about. But here we are on this ground where covenants are renewed. On this ground where reproaches are rolled away. We have come to no other but to the lover of our souls our friend, Lord Jesus. As you feel the pain of these your daughters, my father, bring healing, bring restoration, Restore the wine of their marriages. Make their marriages exciting once again. There are five of you. You've stood out. You came. Yes, as you were coming, it's like, okay. I prayed about this matter over and over again. Let's see what will happen. God is bigger than your problem. 
He reigns supreme. Jehovah reigns supreme. He has asked me to tell five of you that he knows the thoughts he thinks towards you. That they are thoughts of good, not of evil, to give you a hope and a future. So though it seems to you that you have come to the cul de sac, this appears to be an, a dead end to you. But God says there is light at the end of the tunnel. And so, Father Lord, I thank you for favor. As our mama has decreed and declared, I reiterate that favor is released upon these daughters that as they return home, they would find favor, <laughs> amazing favor. <laughs> Uh, uncommon and unusual favor <laughs> before their husbands <laughs> and the brothers standing <laughs> your wives that had despised you <laughs> will begin to honor you <laughs> because God has changed your countenance Father, we thank you because together we march on the devil, the killer of our marriages. We march on you. We say your end has come. Pack and get out of our homes right now. And as you're running, take with you all that you came with whether they be house helps whether they be drivers whether they be in-laws whatever they are carry them and go father we thank you it is well with you sisters god has had us return and be joyful. Rejoice and be glad. Hallelujah. Rejoice and be glad. Hallelujah. Rejoice and be glad. Please return to your seat. Just rejoice and be glad. I will rejoice and I will be glad. Hallelujah. Yes. A bonjo to go is over a son. A bamba bamba, a bamba Jesus. Amen. We want to take offerings. Oh, I'm here to receive your offerings, whichever way. Glory to God. Permit me to read some scriptures to us. But before 